very, very controversial issue. And there are a lot of ways that we can talk about this. We can frame it in a lot of different ways. But we need to be careful here in this learning community to make sure that we respect each other's perspective. We need to make sure that we, if we delve further into some of these subjects, that we frame it in our own perspective. We need to understand something primarily. We, have a, we need to have a covenant between us and the greater community. We need to understand that there are competing perspectives out there. There are competing stories. There are competing ideas that may, once put down on a piece of paper or once discussed, have a lot of the same foundations. So we may disagree on the surface, but in the end, our foundation and our core is the same, which is why it's very exciting for me to be here on, on Constitution Day, which in the end we're going to discuss is the foundation of our country and some of the, the philosophies that we share. So with that, thanks again for having me, and we will get started. First of all, the, the discussion, torture terrorism, terrorism in the U.S. Constitution. Like I said, these are broad and complex issues. What we're going to do today is we're going to escape on the top uh, of each individual issue of torture, terrorism, and, constitu and the Constitution. And what I mean by that is we're going to look at torture as a tool and, and, and as, a, as an issue that's relevant and it's hot. Okay? There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of ways to discuss this, like I mentioned earlier, but... This also shows this issue of torture in the context of terrorism and the war on terror, and in the context of our foundation of, of the U.S. Constitution, is, has evolved so quickly in the last eight to 10 years. And so that's something that I'm very excited to talk about. But just know that each one of these slides, we can delve into them for a full semester. We can talk about the military perspective. We can talk about the, uh, uh, the lawyer's perspective. We can talk about policy. We can talk about you know, international law, this thing can go on for hours and hours and hours. And I, frankly, am too tired to do that. So we're just going to go for about 20 minutes. If you have any questions, raise your hand and, and, uh, and let's talk about it. All right, let's see if my thing works here. My name is Greg Gillette. You always have to have your name on PowerPoint, so I was told. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about torture. We're going to define torture. Okay. We're going to define torture as best we can because there's tricks, okay? We're also gonna look at this through the perspective of, of lawyers. I'm a lawyer, I also am you know, an educator, consider myself an educator, and those two things collide a lot more than you would think. So we're gonna look at, we're gonna define torture as best we can. We're gonna address the legality of torture, okay? We're gonna talk about, is torture legal? It's a question that we take for granted. Uh, we're gonna talk, uh, we're, then we're going to discuss torture in the context of terrorism and the time that we live in, uh, apply the U.S. Constitution, and sort of anticipate change in U.S. policy. We're going to talk about why do we care? Why do we in Porterville really care about this? Let's define torture. First, we're going to talk about what kind of torture. There's terroristic torture, which essentially means, uh, as it says up there, it's torture used as a deterrent, a signal not to defy authority. So basically what we're talking about, oh, and I should say, there are some very graphic things. Uh, I don't mean to be flippant about any of them. And if they bother you, I apologize, but this is something that's real important for us to talk about. So we're talking about, not talking about terroristic torture, which means I'm going to go into a village, string up a couple people, hang them on the side of the road so that everybody knows not to mess with me as the, uh, as the, the state. Okay? What we are going to be talking about is interrogational torture, which essentially we're using tactics to extract information from somebody. Okay? So that's what we're doing. We're also going to be looking at forward looking uh, interrogational torture, which means we are trying to extract information that in the future could help us do something. Okay? So there's backwards looking torture. If you want to know something and you pull somebody in and I do something to you to get information from the past that's backward looking, we're not looking at that. We're also going to be looking at it in the context of international conflict, maybe. Okay? Torture defined. These are two 
common examples of torture tactics. The one on the left is waterboarding. One that's, and I don't know if you can read it, but I'll, I'll read it to you. Waterboarding, and that's something that's very uh, commonly discussed in current issues right now. The picture on your right, on your right is uh, Abu Ghraib, and the incidents that happened there in 2004. Now I want you to take these images and I want you to take them out of your head. Okay? It's like saying, hey, don't think about the elephant in the room. I know it's difficult to do, but I want you to work with me, you know, right along with me, to try to decide what our idea of torture is. Okay, I'm going to say torture a whole lot, but I want you to take, take your idea and say that is absolutely 100% torture. That right there is torture. I want you to take that away. Okay? Difficult to do, but let's try it together. Okay, so let's look at the law on torture. What defines torture? Okay, what constitutes torture? Again, uh, according to U.S. Code, I didn't cite it, right? Which Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 113C, Section uh, 2340. Okay, torture defined. I'll need to read it here. Let's read it together. Torture means an act committed by a person acting under the color of law, specifically intended to inflict severe physical or mental pain or suffering other than pain or suffering incidental to a lawful sanction, to lawful sanctions, upon another person with, within his custody or physical control. Sounds clear enough, right? It's easy. Now you know what torture is. This is the U.S. anti-torture law. This is what we define as torture. In every law, as you probably know, you're going to have rules and restrictions or rights and obligations, but you're going to have to define every single term within those, within those uh, within those laws uh, so precisely that everybody knows what to do with those laws. Okay, everybody knows how far they can go or what not to do, right? Okay, we'll keep going. We're gonna continue with, uh, with section 2340. They had to define severe mental pain, and you can read it up there. It means prolonged mental harm caused by, by or resulting from uh, an intentional infliction or threatened infliction of severe physical pain or suffering, the administration or application or threatened administration or application of mind-altering substances or, or other procedures calculated to disrupt profoundly the senses or personality. And it goes on. Okay? It goes on and it defines these words. There's another section in there that, that further defines other sections in the U.S. anti-torture law. But you get the idea. Okay? We have what the word torture means and we have what the individual terms inside it mean. Now this is all a lot of, this gives lawyers a lot of ammunition to parse this thing out, right? I can sit here and say, well, I can convince you that you know what torture is according to that definition, and then the next second convince you that you really don't. And I think that's, that's what we're dealing with here. Let's see. <clears throat> the United Nations Convention Against Torture, Article 1, essentially says the same thing. <coughs> Okay, so now we're in international law. The U.S. anti-torture law says that this is what torture is. Article 1 of the, of, the, of the United Nations Convention Against Torture essentially reiterates the same thing as U.S. anti-torture law. It actually probably went the other direction, but what this is is an international law. And the way international law works is we have a bunch of countries. Okay, these countries are going to write an agreement on something. And, it, and they're going to agree to abide by this agreement in certain situations. And if that's not general enough, uh, then I, I don't know what is. But basically, a group of countries got together and says, we, we think torture is bad. And so we want to define what it is, and we want to make it illegal. So these countries then got together and said, this is what I think it should be. They agreed on it, and they signed it. The United States, the president signs the treaty, the Congress ratifies it, it becomes law. Okay? We can go into that area of international law or, or domestic law uh, for an entire semester. But <coughs> what you need to know is that the United Nations Convention Against Torture says essentially the same thing as U.S. Uh, law. We'll move on to the Geneva Conventions. <coughs> the Geneva Convention essentially expands, expands the idea and the protection against torture to protected persons in times of war, in times of conflict, there's an entire year's class at Berkeley that discusses this issue. There's, there's two years uh, at the U.S. Naval Academy 
on this subject alone, along with their field name. Okay? But essentially what you need to know is that the definition of torture is essentially the same throughout international law, throughout military law, throughout the United States Code. So here's our question. <coughs> is torture illegal? According to our U.S. Code, Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 113, Section 2248, the answer is yes. Let's read it. Whoever outside the United States commits or attempts to commit torture shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 20 years or both. And if death results to any person from conduct prohibited by this subsection, <coughs> shall be punished by death or imprisoned for any terms, uh, term of years or for life. Sounds like it's illegal to me. Right? Generally, torture is illegal under the U.S. Uh, Constitution. Who does it pertain to? Which is really important question when we're talking about things that happen outside the United States. The jurisdiction says there, the jurisdiction over the activity prohibited in sub subsection A, which is what I read. The alleged offender, if the alleged offender is national of the United States, or if we find him here, if that person commits torture somewhere else and they're not a national, but they're in, in our hands, it's illegal, and we got them. We're going we're gonna to punish them underneath this, this section of the law. Okay. International law. Geneva Conventions has similar language, so I'm just going to do a shortcut here. Geneva Convention is torture illegal. Under the Geneva Convention, as standard and as set forth in that law, yes, it's illegal. Convention Against Torture. It's the first one that, that we read of international law. Is it illegal? Yes. Okay. Uh, international, you know, you know the covenant against torture, I apologize. International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which is another international document that, 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 that there are many signatories to. I think, there are, I think it's India and, and China are not signatories to that law. And I think maybe one Middle Eastern country, but I'm not sure. But essentially, it's illegal. And then we can go a step further and talk about uh, the common practice in international law and essentially the common law of the world and say torture is illegal. There's, there's just no question about it. And I'm sounding like a broken record here. And I think there's a reason for that. Because now we're at the point, now we're at the point where we're really going to ask ourselves, let's look around us in the world. Let's look around us on, in international conflicts. And is torture illegal? September 11th, 2001. There's not much more we need to talk about of that, except I think we can all agree right now that that changed everyone's life in this country, if not the world. I think that we can say fairly that on a personal level, that impacted us some, some way. In the, in the idea of the law, and specifically relating to the concept of torture, and through the Senate tailspin, it changed the game in the middle of everything that we were doing. So we just talked about everything, torture being illegal, there being, there being <laughs> jurisdiction established in certain laws, international law says it's illegal. But now we have sep September 11th. And not specifically in the disorder in these next couple slides. We, we invaded Afghanistan. Remember how earlier I said every slide you can, you can go into and, and dis uh, dissect? Well, this is one of those slides. Well, was it an invasion of Afghanistan? Was it an invasion? There's lawyers that say, well, yes, no, we don't know. Was it of Af Afghanistan? Well, we kind of went into Pakistan a little bit. We started over here in this area, and we kind of came. So it wasn't really Afghanistan. It was wherever the Taliban were. So we're touching on a lot of these contra controversial issues. I want you guys to be aware of that. Okay. Same with the next slide, the, the Iraq War. There's a lot, as you guys know, for reasons of going in and, uh, and starting this conflict, how we continue in this conflict, and how we, you know, we go further into the future. But what I want us to realize is that these things would not have happened necessarily and put us in the position where we are had it not been for the terrorist attack on September 11, 2001. Can we all agree on that? We, we have a military expert in the audience who doesn't, and so we can talk about that, as, uh, and that's the issue. But let's, let's do agree that there is a war on terror. 
as policy of the United States. Can we agree on that? That the policy of the United States is, is, is that we have a, a war on terror. This is, this is something that happens all the time. Whenever I talk about terrorism or international law, you get somebody who's actually been on the ground, who's actually been a leader in the military, has experience, they say, that's not exactly how it is, okay? And it's valid. It's a differing perspective. If you're talking to me as a lawyer or a policymaker, you know, that's something that we need to be aware of. But let, let, let's agree for, for a second that there's a war on terror. And that's the, that's the dynamic that we've entered into. So what has, the, what has changed? What is different now? What's the public perception of what we're doing as a policy? I have a little clip for you that I want you to listen to. I'll stop in the middle of it, but you'll get the idea. So this is, what, this is where we are, if I can figure out where we go. Well, the big security story tonight, terrorists detonate a mini nuclear bomb in downtown Los Angeles, the plan to kill hundreds of thousands of Americans, fact or fiction? Well, certainly may be fiction for now, but 24's Jack Bauer has it right. People need to wake up to the possibility of nuclear attack. This isn't only coming from Hollywood. The reality is a major European bank is now issuing a warning about a possible strike on Iran's nuke program. And in Washington, there's fear about Iran's nuke capabilities, of course, and fear the U.S. will open an Iran war front, which could lead to more terror attacks here. Is 24's faux suitcase nuke bomb a real wake-up call for America? Should we take this as an early warning sign that something like this could happen here? Joining me now, Mike Baker, a former CIA operative, also national best-selling author, Bat Brad Thor, author of the book uh, Takedown. So, Brad, uh, did you, we, a lot of people watched 24 last night, and yet we're yep. seeing these things pop up in the headlines all the time. Should we take it seriously? George in Barbados writes in, Glenn, Bush administration and the American media always paint a terrible picture of the beheadings and other horrible crimes being committed in Iraq, yet they try to downplay the ill treatment of our prisoners in Guantanamo. Let's not forget the horrible things the Marines did to the prisoners in Iraq. Isn't that somewhat hypocritical? Uh, no. Mm -mm, I don't think so. I mean, look, no conservative that I know was tougher on Abu Ghraib than I was. It shouldn't have happened, and it should definitely never have been downplayed. That legitimately hurt us in Iraq, and it was pointless. Now, me, I'm for more Jack Bowers. The Jack Bauer that has to extract information, that's one thing. But Lindy England taking pictures of, you know, a naked pyramid, that was just stupid and pointless. But to compare that to a beheading of an innocent worker or a soldier who was kidnapped is a little over the top. Glenn, relax. I know it's Korea. Everything's going to be okay. The situation is all a setup by Fox Television to promote the new season of 24. Remember, Jack Bauer was kidnapped by China, so he's already in the area and he's going to take care of North Korea and their bomb. Okay, I'm going to stop. I, that, that's a 12-minute clip of uh, it's fair and balanced. By the way, I want you to know, I'm fair and, balanced. And, uh, and balanced it as best as I could. Um, however, my editing skills are limited, um, but, as is theirs. But. This idea is out there, and it may be easy for some of us to say, well, that's limited to this, this bunch of yahoos, or that's limited to that, that group of folk over there, or, or these groups of people. But the fact that that idea even exists, that we're talking so flippantly about, about torture, and the next clip goes on to say, I don't care what they have to do to get information and talks about the ticking time bomb hypothetical, which goes, if you five uh, planned suicide bombings at five, different, at five different shopping malls, and two of them have gone off and killed hundreds of people, and I captured you four, and knew that one of the four had information, would it be okay? Would it be okay for me morally to torture these individuals until I find out where the other three uh, shopping uh, bombs are. That's the dynamic that we're in now. And that, and, and that raises where we're going now, which is the constitutional question. Okay? No time in history have we been so preemptive in discussing uh, issues of constitutionality as it applies to, uh, as it relates to the Constitution as we did uh, in these next slides. We had three very, very 
uh, prestigious jurists, uh, attorneys working for uh, the Bush administration or the Department of Justice, uh, and one who's just a Harvard professor. But these are really bright guys. And before this time, before this time, they, their, their scholarship was, was renowned. These were the experts in whatever they decided to study. They're really smart guys. Well, they write three different positions, position papers, essentially, that are based on their research. And what they say, and what we're going to talk about a little bit, Deputy Assistant Attorney General John Hugh, who's now and was before a professor at Berkeley, which uh, incidentally was just named the most conservative law school in the nation, um, to White House, uh, he, he basically says that the interrogation methods do not prohibit, uh, do not violate prohibitions against torture. Okay. Now, his memo is very specific, and he talks about, you know, what you can and can't do, and things of that sort. So. We're just generalizing for this point, but to understand that these guys are saying it's okay what we're doing. Harvard pr professor Alan Dershowitz argues that torture may be constitutionally and morally acceptable. And Judge Feige defines torture narrowly and argues that, uh, that the commander-in-chief powers trump all legislation that say torture is illegal. We're going to go over this fairly quickly. Here's the memo from John Yu. Okay. It, it asks that it, you can read this, and I will incidentally uh, have this up on my website for you to download if you guys want to see it as a starting point, along with the bibliography, which is quite extensive on this. But Professor Yu asked the Bush administration to withdraw its recognition of the rules imposed by the Geneva Convention so far as the treatment of prisoners belonging to Al Qaeda and the Taliban were concerned. Specifically, they're saying Al Qaeda, the Taliban, we can do whatever we want to to interrogate these folks. And he made a very compelling and strong <coughs> argument, preemptively. Not, he's not defending what has been done in the past necessarily, but he's saying, uh, Mr. President, you can go forward on this. Okay? And essentially, then he said, it took it one step further, you're not only not, uh, okay to do it under, under our law, but it's not against international law. This is a video of John Yu, just so you can see how the Congress dealt with it. Is there anything, Ms. Professor Yu, that the President could not order to be done to a suspect if he believed it necessary for national defense? Well, I, I, Mr. Chairman, I think that goes back to the quote you just read, because... No, I'm just asking you the question. Maybe it yeah. does or yeah. that doesn't, but what do you think? I think it's the same question that I was asked. Well, and what's the answer? First, can I, can I make clear I'm not talking about... And you don't have to make anything clear. Just answer the question, counsel. I just want to make sure I'm not saying anything. You, you don't have to that. worry about not saying... Just answer the question. Okay. My, my thinking right now... Yes, right now. Okay. My thinking right now... This moment. Yes. This, this moment, Mr. Chairman, is that, uh, f you know, first... The question you're posing... What is the answer? I'll stop it there. Whenever you see a congressional hearing, if you ever hear an exchange like that, you know, you know lawyers are involved. Okay? Because what's happening is our, not only has our dynamic changed uh, policy-wise, but these lawyers are so entrenched in making that policy that they can't answer a, a straightforward question. Now, there's argument to say that the Congress couldn't ask, answer, ask a straightforward question, but this is, what, this is how we are dealing with our policy. This is what we're doing to make policy on this specific issue. Okay, the next slide, we'll go over. Oops, sorry. Next slide is essentially uh, discusses, let's see, uh, Alan Dershowitz, Professor Dershowitz argues that torture may be morally and constitutionally acceptable method for United States officials to use to extract information from terrorists when the information may lead to saving lives. He advocated uh, non-lethal torture without any threat to life. He also advocated for torture warrants, saying, I think Mr. Hargis uh, has some information. I'm going to go to a judge and say, these are the things that lead me to believe it. So what I'm going to do is then get, get sterilized needles and put them underneath his, uh, uh, his fingernails until he tells me what I want him to tell me. Okay. This is what we're... This is the, the world that we're living in. Even though it's clearly on the books, yes? What would happen if, um, what is it, if you actually got someone that you thought it was actually one of them, but in the real persons that were actually doing the terrorists, and they 
actions on another person that gets a random person of their own and put it there, and you're trying to torture that person, wouldn't that be something that you're still doing? That's, that's an excellent question. And that's, this, is, this is exactly why I wish we had a full semester on this subject. But here's, here's the short answer. It, it happens, most likely. But let's say we got the right person. Let's say we got the right person. Mr. Harvest actually does know something, okay? The question then is, what can we do? Where do we go to get that information, okay? How sure are we that he's gonna tell us the right stuff? Or is he gonna tell us what we want to hear? Because it might be different. He might not have planned it a big enough attack. And we're thinking he's gonna do all of these things. And, that, the, and those are the questions that we need to ask. How sure are we? Are we 100% sure that he's gonna give us what we need? And the answer is always no, right? And then, but that's an entire section of uh, <coughs> slide, uh, what's the, you know, there, there's all kinds of fallacies in logic. So there's applied uh, physiologist, no, not physiologist, philosophy. Applied philosophy is the subject that you're talking about. And the questions are, you know, how far are we going? And what questions do we need to ask? And what are the chances that this is actually helping? So that's a great question that we don't have an answer to for sure. But there's legal cases that that happens. <coughs> there's, a, there's, other, there's other questions too, which the next slide uh, sort of briefly discusses. Uh, the Honorable Jay Bybee, he, he says the same thing. He says, torture should be, uh, should be reserved only for the infliction of a sort of extreme pain that would be associated, associated with death or organ failure. So it's not torture if we just make him feel all kinds of pain, but it's torture if we were gonna kill him or if he gets real close or his organs fail. The other thing that he argues is he argues that it's not torture if I hire this guy to go to Albania and he do the torture. He sub we subcontract our torture. He makes that argument. Now, these are things we can disagree on and we can fight about and we can say we need to do these things. And I don't <laughs> wanna get into that discussion on purpose, but I want us to know that this is a different dynamic than before. This is a different dynamic. Do we have a question up there? Okay. So then, another constitutional issue pops up in Judge Bybee's report, which we don't have time for, but he says, you know, not only that, but none of this stuff applies to you, Mr. President, because you're the commander in chief and this is a time of war. Okay? Do I agree with that? Or not? I don't, that's not the point, I don't think. So let's get into the Constitution. We're almost done. Is that fast? It's five minutes fast? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're almost done. We'll take questions after this. But let's talk about the Constitution. The Eighth Amendment of the, the Constitution of the United States, by the way, you can get a free download on, on your iPhone, so you can constantly walk around with a, with a Constitution in your pocket, which I do. But this uh, reads, excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fine imposed, but cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. The way this works, I'm sure you guys know, is that this is the foundation of our law. We have then interpreted the law year in and year out through ju judicial decisions. And the next slide is going to talk about just some of these decisions. I just handpicked these. There was no agenda to it. It's just trying to go throughout history and, and talk about these decisions. <clears throat> these cases here, punishments or torture, and all other in the same line of unnecessary cruelty are forbidden. So under the Eighth Amendment, torture is illegal. You go through and you see that in, in, the, in 1976, it continued, 1982, there's a case. In 1990, yes? Were these These are, cr these are criminal cases, yes. You've got to make that distinction that the criminal cases are different than the military. Well, that, that is true. That is true. This is, the U.S. Constitution applies to, to criminal law. Now, the U.S. Consti the, the US military law uh, has similar, uh, has similar uh, protections. But, well, That's not what you're showing us, though. You're showing us civil law. I'm, I'm showing you criminal law, domestic okay. criminal not, law, not right? And if we go into military, if we go to military law, it, it's going to be it's going to be just slightly different, and, and and not much. The the case law is different because the case law is is, is handled with a different method, but the, and the difference is the juries in those cases are made up by officers in that in in, uh, in the military. So, but that's a good distinction to make. Thank you. Could there be a difference between? Uh 
the way we handle citizens and non-citizens? The, the way that it works now, and yes, there is, there is a distinction, but the, the, the argument goes, if they're here uh, in the United States and they're on our soil, and Guantanamo Bay apparently is not considered our soil, it's a military base outside of our soil, then the Constitution applies. And so that's, that's, what, that's where we are right now, I think. Unless I haven't been told. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we'll go through this very, very quickly. Due process under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment apply uh, according to the case law involved. No person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself or be deprived of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. Here are some of the uh, uh, cases on that. Essentially what they're saying is you, you can't be forced to testify against yourself. If somebody's torturing you, to get information that incriminates you that's against the Constitution. Okay, and I'm being overly broad. I, there, there's, a, there's a reason for that, okay? So where are we now, right now? 2005, motivated in part by the global and domestic outcry over the Abu Ghraib scandal, Congress passed the Detainee Treatment Act, which prohibits uh, all cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment and requires that all in, uh, interrogations in military facility comply with the Army Field Manual, which is based under constitutional principles. Uh, the, the law was weakened by amendments and the White House attempt to, to circumvent the limits on detaining uh, torture. This is taken out of the Washington Post. Okay. What happened here is that we made a law. Senator McCain, I think it was McCain, uh, Senator McCain and one of his colleagues extended that that prohibition on torture and said this is what we need to do. We weren't specific enough in our anti-torture law. We needed it specifically for military. Then the, uh, the Bush administration issued a signing statement, which is an official document in which the president lays out his interpretation of a new law. He says, sure, that's a good law. House passed it, uh, Senate passed it. It's on my desk. I'll sign it, except, except uh, I will decide the view of the interrogation limits in the context of my power to protect national security. And that goes all the way back to Professor Hugh, Professor Dershowitz, and, and Judge Biden. <coughs> so we're now saying torture is illegal, except unless the, the president doesn't think of this. Or we need to protect our national security. Okay? So now, yes, ma'am? Was that within his constitutional right to do that as commander in chief? That's an argument. Yes, that's an argument that it is. It is an important question. That, it is, man. that well, and this is this is this is exactly the point, and we're almost done. This is exactly the point. There's no special constitutional law. Lawyers and lawmakers have the responsibility to make those arguments. They have a responsibility to make those statements and to bring together laws that will best protect us and serve us. But it's interesting that you asked that question. My last slide. Let's see if I can see where I am. These are, these are military leaders. We don't have enough time to show this. I'll show a little bit of it. These are military leaders. Commanders at all levels set the tone. The president has to clearly state where he stands, and that should be at the highest level of American values. From bottom to top, it's been a failure in leadership. Somebody's always going to be able to make the argument that, well, there's certain elements on the other side that they're not going to follow the rules anyway. But I didn't think the idea of the game would become them. Uh, I thought the idea was to stay in the United States with our ideas, ideals and our values. Torture under every circumstance is wrong. Doesn't speak to this country, this heartland, this country of wonderful. So that's what we have in those, and I'm cutting it short due to time. But so policy then, if the presidential argument that the president as a commander in chief has the power to make this decision, this is what we have to look through. Senator Obama, recently yet another disturbing memo emerged from the Justice Department. This one said that not even interrogation methods that, quote, shock the conscience would be considered torture, nor would they be considered illegal if they had been authorized by the president. Senator Obama, this kind of reasoning shocks the conscience of many millions of Americans and many millions of people of faith here and around the world. Is there justification for policies on the part of our nation that permit 
physical and mental cruelty toward those who are in our custody. We have to be clear and unequivocal. We do not torture. Period. There's that. Um, we're, we're getting ready to go. Who's concerned about the Attorney General uh, designate, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Mukasey? He was asked uh, whether or not he thought uh, waterboarding was torture. He said he wasn't sure. That's a similar position uh, to Mayor Giuliani, who said the same thing uh, this week. You fundamentally disagree. Anyone who says they don't know if waterboarding is torture or not has no experience in the conduct of warfare and national security. Okay, that's where we are. Now, I'm going to suggest to you something, my final, my final words, and then I'll play this last clip, about 40 seconds long, is that we wouldn't have this discussion. We wouldn't be able to have this discussion as the United States of America if we did not have the foundation of the Constitution if we were not so clear in, in not necessarily the intent or the rule of law, but so clear in our intent to create a document that serves as the foundation of the United States of America. And I don't care where you lie on either side of any of these subjects, but the fact that we're having this discussion, the fact that we're having it in legal circles, in, in, in college campuses like this, and everywhere else in the United States, shows that we, we did something right 200 and some odd years ago. And I think that's, that's the message that this discussion shows in such a short amount of time, from 2001 to now. It's evolved so quickly. Okay, now we don't know where we're going to be. We don't know what's going to happen policy-wise. And this final clip, if you, you guys can, you're welcome to leave at, at that time. Uh, but I'm going to play this final clip for, from Justice Scalia, who sits on the Supreme Court of the United States issues like torture I don't like torture I'm, I'm, although defining it is 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 going to be a nice trick but I mean who's who's in favor of it nobody and we have a law against torture but if the everything that is hateful and odious is not covered by some provision of the Constitution thank you very much everybody have a wonderful time